musicians. God bless you. Good to see everybody here this morning. This is a great day to be in God's house. Wasn't it good to see the sun shine outside? And when you woke up, it uh, maybe still was dark, but it wasn't dark very long, not like it was last week. So good to see that sun shining and up early this morning. Let's begin our service today by singing, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. seated at the right hand of the Father. He can reign upon the throne of your heart also if you allow him to make him first place right now, right this morning as we worship, as we listen to God's word. Be seated, congregation. Once again, thank you for being here. If you're watching via the internet, we welcome you as well. We hope you'll participate in worship as it's possible for you to do so. And so God bless you for tuning in today in whatever medium you may be uh, watching us on. Let's make a few announcements this morning. Operation Christmas Child, uh, you, that really needs your attention. If you want to participate in that, the deadline is coming up pretty quickly. It'll be here before you know it. 
And so the shoe boxes are right through these double doors. You pick up a shoe box, the instructions are there. Help a child overseas through the Franklin Graham Ministry, Samaritan's Purse. It's a great ministry. Churches all over every denomination are doing this. And so help us fill up a box, bring it back, and be a part of that. Our blood drive is happening on the 15th of uh, November, so that's in a couple of weeks. You'll uh, pay attention to that if you would. Next Sunday morning, our uh, veterans observance will be held. If you have, uh, are a veteran, you have not given us your information, and you're new to the church, or maybe you didn't in years past, or you want to update something, you need to let us know. But we'll be showing that veterans video. It has all the veterans, some, some folks of our church that have passed on, of course, and some that are still here, of course, and active duty. We want everybody to be included in that. So please get that information to Patty if you want to do anything different or if you want your name added to that list. We'll be observing that, singing a little patriotic music and having a small portion of a patriotic observance next Sunday morning. Our, uh, I want to make call attention to the fact that we are now live streaming once again. We did that on uh, the Internet during our shutdown time, but we're live streaming on Wednesday night. We have, we've never stopped on Sunday morning or Sunday night, and we will continue. But now we've started back on Wednesday night. So if you're at home right now or driving or whatever, well, maybe you're not driving. You know, but <laughs> wherever you're listening, tune in on Wednesday night. And... Uh, listen to us as well on Wednesday night. All right, our Thanksgiving meal. Look at the bottom of the bulletin there. There's one big change this year. You don't have to bring anything, all right? It's all provided. Not even a part of it will be potluck. Everything's provided. You just need to show up. I would, we would like you to bring a guest, and especially if that guest might be a prospect for Emmanuel, all right? So invite somebody to come. And then also we're participating in our ministry where we hand out meals across our city on that evening. And so well, there's a sign-up list on the sign-up table in back for those people that think they might want a meal brought to their home. There's a separate sign-up list if you'd like to participate in the delivery of those meals. And so let's get that started. Thanksgiving also will be here before long. Also, those lists for names of people that want a meal will also be in your Sunday school classroom as, as well. So you could give us the meals of, of uh, relatives you have, maybe neighbors, the people that are somewhat homebound and won't, won't be here and want a meal brought to them on that night. We want to thank all those who helped in the uh, trunk or treat last night. It went very well. Amy had her uh, troops organized, and we had uh, a little over 300 children in, in amongst the cars that came through. We had prepared 400 bags of candy. We gave out a little bit over 300. So that was a, about the same turnout that we usually have on a normal year. And so thank you everybody that did that. I know many, many of you brought candy and contributed in that way. Well, we're going to continue to worship together this morning. A good old hymn, Down at the Cross Where My Savior Died. <laughs>
Amen. Thank you, choir. Let me remind you, we keep a prayer list up on the front that if you would like to come up before the service and write down a name uh, to publish before everyone that we might pray over them in the service, please do so. Just come up, write the name and the need if you want to put the need on there or just unspoken. And then after that, you pray for them a moment in the altar, then we'll lift them up as well. This morning, we have Tracy Johnston. Uh, Tracy is dealing with rheumatoid arthritis and trying to figure out how they can uh, keep that from hurting so bad. So if you would remember Tracy in your prayer. All right, well, let's stand together and let us pray. Father, we delight ourselves in your presence. We thank you that we have the opportunity to be here this morning, that you've given us strength of body and soundness of mind, that we can come together and we can sing your praises, that we can uh, communicate with one another and teach and learn from one another that we can hear your message through your messenger. That, Father, we be able to to lift up our prayers. All these things are so meaningful to us, for it's our way of communicating to you and allowing you to speak to our hearts as well. We want to have fellowship, not only with those around us, but we want to have fellowship with you this morning. Stir up your spirit within us. If there be any among us today who do not yet know Jesus as Lord and do not yet possess your Holy Spirit, we pray the day might be the day that you open their hearts and minds to the gospel, that they might uh, become a disciple of yours, that they might follow you, and that they might be born again. This is our desire, and we know it's your will, because that's why you sent your son into this world, because you're not willing that any should perish. Father, we just pray that over all that takes place today, whether it be in this room or in the Sunday school classes, that Jesus will be lifted up before our eyes, that we'll be able to be learners, and that we'll be able Uh, whatever we learn to live it out each and every day. We pray for our nation as we enter into this week of elections. We pray that your will will be accomplished. We pray, Father, that you'll raise us up godly leaders. We recognize how far adrift we are as a nation, and we need repentance. So we're going to humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways that you might hear our prayers, that you might forgive our sins, and that you might heal this land. We recognize that this land is only going to experience revival when your people experience revival. And so, Father, we pray that we might do that today. We bless you for all the kind things that you've done for us this week. It would take us forever to, to name all the wonderful things that you've been doing for us. We pray for our missionaries that are abroad. We pray for our military as well, that you'd keep them safe, bring them back home to us very soon. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. You may be seated. We're so glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us and never filled out a visitor's card, if you would, inside your book in this little place, a little flap that says welcome, fill that out if you would, please, both sides if you would like. Tear that off at the end of the service when you're ready to leave. If you will, on the back wall inside this room here, on the back wall are some brown buckets. Uh, That's where we leave our offering if you'd like to give an offering. But if you will, just take that piece of paper, drop it in that bucket, and that'll get back to me, and I would appreciate it so very, very much. Well, let's continue to worship the Lord together this morning.
you've given praise today for what God has done for you in your life this week so far and what he's going to do the coming week. Children, it's time for you to be dismissed to Children's Church. So second grade and younger, please come right on down to the front and then over to your right and my left. We'll have that together. Kenny and Tanya Shade are coming now. They're going to sing our special music this morning. With no prayer to pray and no song left to sing. Whatever pain you're dealing with, let me offer this. Come, come however you are. Come with all your heartbreaks. Come with all the mistakes you made. Lay them down at the cross. Start falling apart. Come, however you are. To the girl who never had a father. To the guy who thinks he'll never amount to much of anything. To those of us who feel unwanted, unneeded, unloved, and Desperately incomplete. Come, however you are. Come with all your heartbreaks. Come with all the mistakes you made. Lay them down at the cross. Give them to the God who loves you. Hurt, scarred, falling apart. Come, however. Come with the things you can't change. Come with all your fears and all your shame with everything. Come with the pieces of your bruised and broken heart. Don't wait. Don't wait. Whatever pain you're dealing with, Let me offer this come however you are. Come with all your heartbreaks, come with all the mistakes you made. Lay them down at the cross, give them to the God who loves you. Hurt, scarred, falling apart. Come however. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you, Tanya. If you will, take your Bibles and let's go to Luke in chapter number 14. As Jesus is walking along the way in his ministry, oftentimes he would look behind him and find people just following along. Sometimes it would be a crowd of over 5,000 people. Oftentimes it would be a smaller crowd from town to town. But one day he stops and he tells them what the cost of discipleship is going to be. If you're going to continue to follow me, 
This is what's going to be required of you. And so we're going to be talking about what is required of discipleship. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, what does that really look like? How does that flesh out? Well, stand with me as we look at Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse number 25. The words of our Lord Jesus, it says, Now the great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he is a, have enough to finish it? Lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Well, what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. May God receive blessed the read of the scriptures. You may be seated. It's always good to keep a text within its context. What had just happened in Jesus' life, Jesus is building off on. Jesus, prior to this, gives an invitation to discipleship. And before he gives this invitation to discipleship, he relates a parable where he gives an invitation to a dinner. People who had already been contacted and invited, they were on the guest list, who previously had committed to come to that feast, suddenly were just too busy when Jesus gave the command. He told about a man who had a feast. He told about a man who sent out his servants, said, it's all ready. Go tell the people to come on in. But suddenly, everybody was too busy. They had more important things to do. They had people they needed to see. And so they just could not come. Now, the excuses varied. Some said, well, I just bought a yoke of oxen. I need to go see that. I got, I got something I need to do. Another said, I bought a piece of land. I need to go look at that. I got something to see. Another said, well, I just took a wife. I, I'm pretty busy right now, and so I can't come either. All of them had excuses, but none had any reason, except they just really didn't want to be involved, and they were uncommitted. Now, building off of that parable that Jesus tells, how people are invited, but when it's time to actually do something, he says, now let me tell you about discipleship. So this invitation to dinner winds up being an inv invitation to discipleship and he begins to declare the cost of discipleship and extends an invitation to those who want to meet this criteria to come and follow me now before he offers the multitude a place in his kingdom he wants them to be uh, to understand what the requirements are going to be for them to follow him now what does Jesus mean when he several times in this passage says the word disciple what is a disciple well, the word is used hundreds of times in the four Gospels and in the book of Acts. Hundreds of times you'll find this word, and it literally means a learner or a pupil. One who learns or attaches themselves to a teacher, and they learn what that teacher wants to teach them. As it relates to Jesus, it came to mean those committed to following Jesus and his teachings. So if you want to be a follower of Jesus, that means you become a pupil. I really don't understand why people have a hard time with Bible study, why, why they don't love Bible study, why they won't commit themselves to Bible study, because after all, the call to discipleship is the call to become a pupil, a student of Jesus Christ, to follow him and his teachings. We're commanded to make disciples of all nations. Then we're commanded to baptize them. And then we're commanded to do what? Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So the call to discipleship is a call to come to Jesus Christ and to be his student, to be his learner, to be his follower. 
And not only do we learn from Jesus, we learn to observe. That is, we learn to do the things that Christ has commanded of us. So the church is more than just spreading information, but rather we're stimulating transformation. We go beyond learning to incorporate living and loving. It's not just a place we come and we get a message or we get a sermon. It's a place where we get a life-changing message whereby we can learn how we can be better disciples, how we can be better followers of Jesus Christ. And though disciples are learners, they are in reality ambassadors for the master. When a person comes to Jesus, what Jesus is saying, I want you to learn from me, and then I want you to go out in my name and be my ambassador. You go out and you make disciples. You bring them to the church where we can baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then the church as a whole takes that newborn baby, that one just born again, and you take that newborn baby and you teach them all the things that Christ has commanded of us. Now here I must make sure you understand in this message that we must differentiate between the kingdom of God and the church on earth. The kingdom of God is made up only of disciples. Only those who have been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus made it very plain that unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. He made it very plain, unless you're born of the water and the spirit, unless you are spiritually born again, you will not enter the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is made up of disciples, those who belong to Jesus, and every disciple is a member of the kingdom of God, and every member of the kingdom of God is a disciple. But that's not true of the church on earth. Of the church on earth, the church on earth is made up of disciples of Jesus Christ who are part of the kingdom, but the church is made up of believers as well. And that is people who believe the right things and understand who Jesus is, yet have never made a true commitment to discipleship. Now let me tell you up front, they're not born again. They'll not see the kingdom of heaven. But they are believers. They believe the right things. While many believe the right things, say the right things, and do many of the right things, they cannot be classified as disciples. By Jesus' definition, at least in this text, a disciple is one who follows Jesus, imitates his lifestyle, keeps his commands, speaks the language of the kingdom, allows the Word of God to transform his or her life. They are becoming a peculiar people, a very peculiar people. Listen, it's going to become more evident the difference between disciples and believers as we become more persecuted in this culture. Because the true disciple is going to become a very peculiar people. And we're going to be able to have to undergo uh, testing, trials, and also tribulation. For the disciple, our goal is... And our dreams, our ambition are, to, are molded and shaped by our love for Jesus, by our desire to please Him. A disciple endures hardships joyfully, accepts criticism and mocking as normal for those who follow after Jesus and walk in His steps. Disciples count it all joy to suffer for Him because He suffered for us. And so a disciple looks at things from the point of view that I am doing only what Jesus himself committed himself to do. That I'm walking in his steps. I'm following Jesus. And Jesus' life included both joy and suffering. It, enjoy, it, in, it uh, included both a crown and a cross. And so a disciple is one who is a follower of Jesus. A disciple is one who is committed to Jesus but a believer just simply believes the right thing. They hold to their beliefs, but in reality, their faithfulness depends upon the weather, upon the circumstances, or whatever mood they happen to be at the time. You challenge a believer about their commitment, and they get testy. They get defensive. They become uh, oftentimes offended. In fact, when I talk to many about their relationship with the Lord, they even act as if I'm... Uh, somehow offending them that I would even ask about that. You know, there's some people, I don't even have to ask about their relationship with the Lord. I see it. 
I mean, they're committed to Jesus Christ. They love Christ. They, they're willing to let go anything in this world that they might please the Lord Jesus. And then there's just some people you just wonder about. They're good people. They're part of the church. And if you ask them, they love the Lord according to their dictates. But when you look at their life, what are they good for? Some would say good for nothing. Now, a lot of those give money to the church, and that's a wonderful thing. That's certainly something you can give. Some of them will show up for an event every once in a while. But other than that, what is their part? You see, a disciple as an ambassador of Jesus Christ is to go forth and make disciples, to bring them to the fellowship, to help them to be incorporated into the body of Christ and to teach them all things that Christ has commanded us. In these believers' moments, as they honestly self-reflect and think about their own life they wonder why their commitment to Christ does not make more difference in their lives as it does in many others oftentimes they doubt their preparedness for eternity they fear death for they are unsure of their position in Christ so they kind of are lukewarm little in the church a little out of the church and they really don't know which they prefer They want to be close enough to Jesus to have everlasting life, but they don't want to be so close to Jesus that it's going to cost them as a disciple. And so they're kind of hedging on their bets. They're hoping for eternity, and the truth is they know in their hearts they're not prepared. You'll find disciples that walk with Jesus don't fear death. Now, we understand death, and probably if you're a new disciple, it's still a little bit of fear there because you haven't come to the conclusions and understanding that many of us who have been disciples for years have understood. A disciple does not fear the things of this world for they know they're walking in the steps of their Lord. And if death comes, if the cross comes, if we must make sacrifices, if suffering comes, it's according to the will of God. And we're doing no more than what our master did for us. You cannot be a disciple without being a believer But you can't be a believer without being a disciple. James, in his little letter, calls this dead faith. Those who believe, but it leads to no maturity. They believe the right things. In fact, in that text, James says, even the demons believe and tremble. And so it's possible to be a believer in Jesus Christ and not be born again. James labels it dead faith. Faith that does not lead to a commitment to Jesus Christ. Now this may best be illustrated by noting the difference between a traveler and a tourist. Which would you rather be, a traveler or a tourist? They're not the same. The word traveler literally means one who travails. One who, it should be, that should be travails, not travels on the deal there. It should be travails, T-R-A-V-A-I-L-S, travails. It comes from a 14th century word meaning one who endures, one who suffers, one who labors. It's one who goes on a a trip of a determined destiny. They're going from one location trying to get to another location, and they do whatever it takes to, to get there. A traveler immerses himself in the culture, tries to learn the language, identifies with the people, acclimates to their diet whenever possible. He adopts their customs. That's a traveler. Paul, the apostle, was a traveler. Whenever Paul would travel all over the empire, he went to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to make disciples, to plant churches. He suffered whatever needed to be suffered. He labored much. There were many dangers in his life that he had to endure. In fact, Paul said of himself, I became, all thi- I became all things to all people that I might by in some way win some. So that was a traveler. One who goes among the people, lives among the people, tries to his best to make an impact upon the people. Now a tourist is different. A tourist are on a pleasure trip. Tourist literally means one who goes in circles. They just take a tour. They are just taking an extended detour home. They're going to wind up where they left at. They desire picturesque and exotic locations. They like ease of travel. Certainly no labor, no dangers or suffering. Their goal is to return home with a few mementos, a few memories, and a few home movies. 
to show with their friends. They want safety and security. They only rub elbows with the locals when it's absolutely necessary. They retreat every night to the safety of their hotel and their cabin. They learn only the absolute necessities in language. They eat their own delicacies. They are spectators and consumers just simply having a good trip who want to be catered to and pampered lest they grow angry because they don't get their way and they just don't like anything not going their way. So the kingdom of God is made up of travelers, not tourists. You see, we boarded the disciple ship, not a cruise ship. We're on a lifeboat out there rescuing the perishing, caring for the dying. We're on a lifeboat that's trying to make an impact upon the world. They're on a simple love boat trying to enjoy the pleasures of life. You see the difference? You can travel one way or the other. You're going to be going around. But what's your purpose? Is your purpose just to have fun in life, to, to avoid all pain and suffering and sorrow? To not ever find yourself to where you have to work too hard? Is it just simply, I want to get through life doing the least I can do, suffering the less that I can suffer? Just really try to get through enjoying life the most that I can enjoy life? Or are you on a, an assignment from the Lord? you got a destiny. And along the way, your goal is to rescue the perishing and to care for the dying. When Jesus turned to the multitude to invite them to follow him, he made it very clear what discipleship would require. There's three things he says that we need to do if we're going to become a disciple. Number one, he says you need to first of all be committed to him above all else. You must be committed to Christ. You cannot be a disciple unless you're committed to Christ above everything else in this world. He phrases, phrases it this way in verse number 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers and his sisters, yes, even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Unless you're willing to commit yourself to Jesus Christ above all else, then you cannot be his disciple. Now notice in this text, right before that, he says he turns to the multitude. This verse is not a call to deeper, deeper discipleship on part of his apostles. This is not a call to deeper discipleship of those who have already been born again. This is a call to salvation. Now, I know there are people who teach, well, you can be saved and later on, then Jesus becomes Lord. Or you can be saved and later on, then you become a disciple. No, they're hand in hand. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ unless you're willing to commit yourself to Jesus Christ above all else. This refutes the common and popular ideal that we see today of self-centered false gospels that we find in contemporary Christianity. You see, Christianity today is all about people, making people happy, making sure they got the right music, making sure the pew is comfortable, making sure the temperature in the room is all comfortable, making sure we don't offend anybody by preaching a message they might not like, staying off of subjects that are touchy subjects because we don't want to, after all, offend anybody. And so we think today that it's all about us. In fact, much of the preaching today is about Jesus making me healthy, Jesus making me wealthy. It's not about me serving Jesus. It's not about me coming to Christ and pouring my life out into His and for service for Him and glorifying His name. It's all about Jesus doing for me. In fact, many versions of the gospel today re reduce God down to simply a genie in a bottle. He's powerful. He's mighty. He grants wishes if you rub Him the right way. In fact, that's what we expect God to do. That's what he's there for. God is here. How much of our prayers are about bless me, give me, do for me, protect me? And listen, there's nothing wrong with praying some of those prayers. But what we have come today to, de to determine is that Christianity is about me. It's about God meeting my needs. Absolutely not. Christianity is about Christ. And it's about me coming to Jesus with what little life I have left 
And you may say, well, I think I've got 80 years left. That's a drop in a bucket. That's one teardrop compared to all the water on the face of the, of, of the world. When are you talking about eternity? With the little bit of life I've got left, coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I've wasted enough life already. Jesus, I cannot save myself. I cannot figure out how to get rid of my own sins. I need you. And Jesus, from this moment forward, you're the Lord of my life. From this moment forward, I am your disciple. I will follow you. I'll leave everybody behind if I have to. I'll leave everything behind if I have to. You see, Christ is calling us to leave all others. He says, whether it's your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your, your children, to leave all others, to leave yourself, even your own life, and all objects. So all others, ourselves, and all objects must be in second place or far down the line to Jesus. He takes number one. In fact, Jesus uses a Hebrew idiom here to help us to understand the difference between my love for Patty and my love for Jesus. My love for Jesus should be so great that the love that I have for Patty, which is above all else in this world, would seem like hatred. When Jesus says you must hate your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your wife, your children, even your own life. Now that word for hate literally means a relative preference for one thing over another. In the way God describes it in Scripture, he says it like this, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Now God did not hate Esau in the sense of the way we in the English think about the word hate. Because God blessed Esau. God made Esau a mighty man on the earth. Kings came from Esau. God gave Esau a mighty piece of land just like he did the Jews. But what he was saying is, my love for Jacob is a choice I make because I love Jacob. I am committed to Jacob and to Jacob's descendants far more than I am to Esau's that it would be like comparison, love and hate. Now God tells us in the scriptures, love your mom and daddy. Respect them. Honor your mother and dad. The Bible teaches us that a husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And a wife ought to love her husband. We're to love our children and children ought to love one another. We're to love our brothers and sisters. The Bible teaches us that. But by comparison, a relative preference for one thing or other, Christ, our love for Christ ought to be so magnificent that by comparison, our love for anything else comes so far down the line that it would seem almost like hatred by comparison. Now, those aren't my terms for discipleship. That's the one who calls and makes disciples. That's the one who has opened the way to the kingdom. And if you're going to follow him into the kingdom, then you must be born again, and you must love him above all else. That's what Jesus requires of us. There are going to be men today, the Bible says, who are lovers of money, lovers of themselves, and lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. But listen to this. He says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such people turn away. In the churches today, we have a lot of people who have a form of godliness Oh, they look a lot like believers. They look a lot like disciples. But the truth is, they're lovers of themselves, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure more than they are lovers of God. And therefore, they will not enter the kingdom of God. If you want to do a study on that, you can go to 2 uh, Timothy chapter number 3, those first uh, 10 or 12 verses there, and read that, and you'll find what, what Paul has to say about discipleship, and it'll line up exactly with what Jesus is teaching right here. So first of all, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, you must be committed to Jesus Christ above everything else in this world. You will leave everything to follow and to serve Jesus. Number two, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, you must carry the cross. Not only be committed to Christ, but you must carry the cross. Look at verse number 27. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Again, not Donnie's words. 
Not the Baptist church's words. This is the Lord's words. One might think Jesus would turn to these people and say something like this. If you come after me and follow me and become my disciple, honor and wealth will be yours here and there will be a kingdom hereafter that you'll be a part of. That Jesus would use the bait, as we see in common Christianity today, that I'm going to enhance your life. I'm going to make your life better. And you know what? Jesus does make your life better. But that's not the bait he uses. Because that's not what he intends of a disciple. When Jesus talks to us about discipleship, Jesus doesn't pull any punches. Now, will Jesus make you healthy? Well, he can. I don't know if he will. You may have to suffer through something you had all your life and Jesus doesn't heal it. But he may. Will Jesus make you wealthy? Well, he could. And by the way, by comparison to the rest of the world, everyone sitting in this room is wealthy. You just got to gotta know what the rest of the world lives in in order to understand how rich we are in this room. Even the least rich of us are not poor by considering what is going on in the rest of the world. You take the 7 billion plus people in the world, almost 8 billion people in the world, we in this room are in the top 3% of all the world, every one of us. We are rich. And so you already have that kind of rich. Will Jesus make you rich? Well, not always. There are a lot of wonderful disciples in China and Korea. Did, did you know that the Koreans have a tradition of getting up about 4 to 5 o'clock every morning? And the, the, the Korean uh, Christians, and they pray for an hour to two hours, spend time in the Word of God before they go off to work. They literally do that almost every day. They pray. Many of them will never own a house, probably never own a car, have very little as far as this world's wealth. Same in Africa and many other nations. Jesus isn't making any promises of this world that we're going to have all the riches and all the things. And so he doesn't say that. What does Jesus say here? Basically he's saying, guys, as we're walking down the road, he's walking down the road. He's got his disciples, his apostles around him, the multitudes behind him. And he turns around and he says to the multitude, listen, guys, are, are you going to follow me? If you are, let me tell you where I'm going. I'm headed towards Jerusalem. Now, I, he didn't say all this here. He said it to his disciples, uh, his apostles earlier. I'm headed to Jerusalem. And when I get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed. And they're going to beat me and mock me and torture me. And I must suffer many things at their hands. And then they're going to take me to a cross and they're going to crucify me. Now, if you're going to follow me, that's what it means. Are you willing to follow me to a cross? And so Jesus basically just says, if you are going to follow me, you're going to have to carry your cross. Because that's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Being willing to die. Now there's not many Christians in America over the last uh, 250 years or so that have been called to bear the cross to the death. Some maybe, not many. But in any, many countries, there, they are around the world today. Many of our brothers and sisters in Christ are dying for their faith. But we must be willing to carry that, carry that cross. In another occasion, Jesus said, not only do we must carry the cross, he said you must die daily to yourself. And that's what he meant by taking the cross. You see, when Jesus mentions the cross here, Jesus did not mean a nagging wife or a cantankerous husband, or a rebellious child, or a, some physical ailment that you must go through, and that's just my cross to bear. They understood the cross was an instrument of torture and death. The cross was a symbol of Roman dominance and oppression. And cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. And if Jesus' disciples had a problem when Jesus said, I'm going to go to a cross and die, and they spoke up and rebuked Jesus and said, no, Lord, you can't do that. That's not God's will. Don't even talk about those things. How do you expect that that crowd following Jesus was going to take this teaching? You see, they had an interest in the kingdom, but they wanted a kingdom with a crown, not a cross. But listen, you'll never get the crown unless you first carry the cross. 
Jesus had to go by way of the cross before he had the crown to be able to rule over planet earth. It had been given to Satan. And when he died on the cross, he received back the crown for mankind to rule upon the earth once again. Satan no longer rules over there. He's still the God of this age. He's still the prince of the power of the air right now. But the, the crown's been given to Jesus. It was a crown of thorns to begin with, but it's going to look a whole lot better in the, in the future. But thank God Jesus was willing to bear that cross. Thank God he was willing to take that crown of thorns upon himself and take everything the world had to offer in torture. And he died for you and me. Jesus isn't calling you to do anything he's not willing to do. Jesus forsook everything. His father's house. He forsook heaven. He came down here to walk a tough road. He was a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. Jesus felt pain like we feel pain. Jesus hurt. His heart was broken. Jesus got thirsty. He grew hungry. When they drove those nails in his hands, he felt it as intensely as you have felt it, would have felt it. All those things he did, and he took up his cross. He's not asking you or me to do one thing he has not already done for us. And so is he right in demanding this kind of commitment? Absolutely. Because it's what he did for us. Now, I'm not telling you you need to do all these things so you can earn your way to heaven. You can never earn your way to heaven. I'm saying that if you want to be born again and a part of the kingdom, you must be committed to Jesus above all else. You must be willing to take the cross and to follow him. Most people in the churches today, they're, they're going to follow Jesus because they want to witness miracles. They want to be, be, be miraculously fed as the people of that day. They wanted to have a hero to destroy their enemies, to meet their needs. But most people today turn away from persecution and hardship. In fact, today, most people will leave the church because they got their feelings hurt. Or they were offended because somebody's told them, that's my pew, you need to get out. And don't you ever say that to anybody. I'll come and rebuke you if I hear about it, all right? But most people are, leave the church. They leave the fellowship. Oh, I'm not leaving Jesus. Yeah, you are. If you're not serving Jesus through the church, then you're not serving Jesus. Because how can you fulfill the great commission of making disciples, baptizing them, and then teaching them unless you're doing it through a church? You say, well, I can do it at home. Then your home becomes the church. And once you get through baptizing a half a dozen people in your bathtub, then you've got 12, 15 people. You've got a church. And if you're doing what Jesus called you to do, you're going to grow. Pretty soon you're going to have a hundred. So you're going to do it through the body of Christ. Now the church doesn't save you, but Christ died for the church. He loved himself. He he saw the church as his bride. He loved the church and he gave himself for her that he might remove every spot and every stain. And so we must be willing to bear the cross. We sing a song from time to time. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. And so if you're not willing to be committed to Christ and carry the cross, you can't be Jesus' disciples. Jesus said, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for the sake of the gospel will find it. And so there's the cost of discipleship. One thing we've got to consider is count the cost. Count the cost. He says in verse number 28, if anyone decides to follow him, he says, you need to sit down first and count the cost, whether you have enough to finish. Don't start in this journey if you're not willing to finish this journey. Count the cost. Is it worth it? Jesus doesn't want some hasty emotional decision, but he wants a well-thought-out commitment. Is it worth it to serve Christ under such demands? What is Jesus offering you? You need to to consider the cross. Is it worth it to follow Jesus? Wouldn't it be better just to do things your way and enjoy life? Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you're going to die. Wouldn't that be better? It depends what you want your destination to be. 
If you're just on a pleasure cruise, if you're on the love boat and you're just trying to find as much fun, eat, drink, and be merry, you're going to wind up exactly where you left. You're just going in circles. But if your goal is eternal life, and you want to see those golden shores of heaven at the end of your voyage, then you better be on the ship, discipleship. And here's what Jesus is offering you, a place in his kingdom. He's not saying, I'm going to give you all the wealth of this world now. You'll have it one day. He's not saying, I'm going to give you health, and I'm going to make sure all your relationships are fixed and just what you want them to be. I'm going to take all your kids out of rebellion. I'm going to, I'm going to bring them all the faith. He's not making any kind of promises like that. He's not doing that. Now, that may happen, and it may not happen. Those aren't the promises Jesus makes. Jesus makes promises for the future. Do you trust him? If you give up his, your life now, he promises you there will be eternal life to come and the blessings that you desire will be your inheritance in the kingdom. When Jesus had a rich young ruler come to him and said, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? See, that was his go. When I end life, I want to have eternal life, he said. That's what I want. Jesus said, go and sell all you got. Come and follow me. Jesus knew he had a covetous heart. Jesus knew he loved his money more than he loved Jesus. He was committed to his riches more than he was committed to Christ. He knew that. And the young man walked off because he couldn't, couldn't turn loose. Jesus turns to his disciples, and here's what he says. Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? What are we going to get out of this deal? Now listen, we are all got that in our hearts. I mean, if at the end of this, wor this world, there was no eternal life to look forward, I would tell you, eat, drink, and be merry. Just do what you want to do. There's nothing after this world. But there is something. Listen to what he says. Jesus entered him and said, uh, Surely I say to you that in the regeneration, that is in the resurrection, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will sit on twelve thrones. Now that's to the twelve apostles. Judging the 12, <coughs> the 12 tribes of Israel. Now this is for you and me. And everyone who has left houses and brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. You see, I've got so much waiting for me in eternity. I've been blessed now. God's blessed me with a wonderful wife and five kids and five, uh, five joined to those kids are my kids as well. So I've got ten kids and I've got nine grandkids and I've, I've got a home that you guys provide for me that I can live in. And if I want to raise, I go turn up the air conditioner. If I, don't, if I want to, uh, and during the winter, if I'm just too cold, I go turn up the, the heat. And so I, I, I've got life good. I get to eat three square meals if I want them, usually eat two. But I, I've got a car to drive in. I got a wonderful church to come to and, and be a part of and get to lead. I got life by the tail. I got it. But even if I didn't have all those things, I would still serve Jesus. I would still give him every bit of my life. Why? Because I believe his promises that one day in the regeneration, one day in the resurrection, God is going to reward his faithful followers and we will receive a glorified, resurrected body. And we will have eternal life with him. What is Jesus offering you? This and this alone. Eternal life. Where are you going to find it anywhere else? If you can find it anywhere else, you go find it there. But I'm promising you this. There is no other name given among men whereby we can be saved other than Jesus. So if you want to know why I serve Jesus... Why as a 16-year-old boy I came to Jesus? Because I believed in my heart at that moment of salvation that there was salvation only in Christ and that if I follow Jesus at the end of my journey of discipleship, I will be with Jesus in eternity. See, if you walk in the steps of Jesus where he is, you will be also. Now, do you have that kind of relationship with the Lord? I'm not asking you this morning, do you believe in Jesus? We all do. I'm not asking you really if you believe in the death, burial, resurrection. I hope you do. I think we all do. I'm asking you, 
Are you going to commit your life to Jesus Christ and become his disciple? And then be baptized. And then become his student and learn to observe all the things that he has commanded. If you're willing to do that, then you come this morning and acknowledge it openly and publicly. Let's stand together. Father, we pray right now as the message has gone forth, the invitation has been given that people will not find excuses or reasons because there's no reason they shouldn't come to Christ. But they'll not give any excuses. But they'll just receive the invitation and come. May you be glorified in their coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.